Turn to uh, 1 Peter chapter 2 this morning. When you come to family camp, you think about the family camps in the past and things like that, at least for me. And Man, I, I appreciate the, the messages we get going, the encouragement there. And, and you know, I, I don't, Mark Miller, I don't see him. Maybe he's here somewhere. But, man, I really appreciated the example he gave about when you pull up for the gas stop and the frantic search for shoes. I don't know what happens. Maybe it's not the same for you guys. But for me, I can tell you that I understand completely what he's talking about. Uh, I don't know what happens in vehicles to the non-driver, but when they take their shoes off, it turns into this giant cavern, evidently, that this search must go on for the shoes. I've, I've been in the back seat of my car, there's not that much room. <laughs> I, 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 it it's befuddles me, so I feel you, brother. Like, I, I got it. Uh, you know, I was thinking about family camps in the, in the years past, and um, I think I've been to most of them while I've been alive. I remember uh, years ago at, at Luckock Park, uh, that was real camping, just so you know. Um, I think there was one porta potty, if I remember right, and it was an old wood job. And it, that one has a particular memory for me, because uh, me and my cousin, Matt Wilson, were sitting behind it, and uh, we were whittling on some sticks with some knives, and uh, we were probably five or six years old, maybe, and uh, Mel Hirsch caught us. Uh, we, we weren't doing anything wrong, but in Mel's idea, two boys sitting behind an outhouse with knives was a bad thing. So he removed us from where we were sitting um, by force. And uh, since then, I've been afraid of Mel my entire life. So uh, it, it was a good way to go. Um, but, man, I hope you're excited to be here today. You know, this is a, an awesome gathering, a, a time for people to come together with like precious faith. To enjoy it. I was I was thinking last night is looking around and you know the the tents got larger, um, more people here. But to think that just really how small of a fraction of God's kingdom this represents. When, when God talks and He says that that His people are going to be like the sands of the seashore, or the stars of the sky. Man, that's an awesome. Thing to think that we are part of something so great that man with current technology can't measure the expanse of it, the immensity of it. That's the kingdom of God. I want us to, to remember that. As I was getting ready for, for family camp, I was doing some stuff around the camper. And literally, a bee made a beeline for me. It's the first time it ever happened, and I'm not one to typically be scared of bees. I mean, I'm the one that everybody else is flapping around. I just kind of stand there. And so, incredulously, I watched this bee come in, fly in, land on my middle finger on my right hand, and sting me. It immediately, didn't do anything else. I was minding my own business, and man, I, I grabbed that bee, and I, I killed him. And somehow, in, in the moment from before I killed him, and when he stung me, he communicated to the other bees in the area that I was an enemy. <laughs> because I'm telling you, I've never had trouble with bees like I did trying to get ready for family camp this year. And I literally ran from them a couple of times. And you know what I was thinking when I was running from those bees and I was waving around? If anybody drives by, you know what they see? <laughs> they don't see the bee. They see me and they're probably like, this dude has lost his mind. <laughs> see, there's little challenges that come up in life. And that bee was one of those challenges. Um, and his friends. <clears throat> this morning we're going to talk a little bit. I'm just going to kind of tell you what we're going to go through. We're going to take a look at the example of Jesus. We're going to take a look at the how that Jesus did this, the why that he did it. We're going to take a look at the context and that relates to us and the how and the why for us as well. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21. It says, For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in His steps, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in His mouth. 
And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. Here's the example of Jesus here. Oh, that, that bee came at me, and I reacted. Not the first one. That was foolish. I should have reacted on the first one. I didn't react that one. But after that, then bees came by, and I have no idea what their intent was, but what came to my mind was, man, these things are out to get me, and i got to get away from them. And I reacted. Notice Jesus. In his life, he committed no sin, nor was there any deceit found in his mouth. Now, I'm, I'm not going to go real deep on some of these things. We're going to hit some wave tops as we go across, but I want you to think about that. Not only did he not sin, there was no deceit found in his mouth. You know, you can tell the truth and still deceive. Now, you, you can communicate a, a partial truth and lead somebody to think exactly what you want them to think. That's deceit. There is no deceit found in his mouth. While reviling, he did not revile in return. That's, a, that's pretty big by itself, isn't it? Uh, someone's coming after you. What's the first thought? Fight or flight, right? I fought the first bee. I ran from the rest of them. But that's the first thought, right? To revile, return, man, to lash back out. Hey, this guy was truly innocent, had done nothing wrong. Did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats. I, I remember the in Billings when the, the Passion of the Christ movie came out and a bunch of us went and saw that. I got to tell you, the the visual that that movie gave to the suffering was something that I never had comprehended before. <laughs> While suffering, he uttered no threats. Man, that, that's pretty amazing. Typically, somebody does something, man, the man's reaction is what? I'm going to get you. That's the example of our Lord. While being reviled, did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats. Was silent, like a sheep led to slaughter. And that's our Lord. That's the example that we have in Jesus. There's this really cool gem in this passage, and we're going to take a look at some stuff around it today in the context. Verse 23. At the end of the verse, but keep, it, but kept entrusting himself. To him who judges righteously. You want to know how Jesus did it? He entrusted himself to him who judges righteously. He knew that the God that had spoke everything into existence, that had created all things, he knew that that God was faithful to perform what he had promised. He knew the prophecies. He knew that he was going to be raised from the dead. He knew that he was going to be enthroned on high. He kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. We're going to read verses 2 and 3 here. Verse 2, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you may not grow weary and lose heart. Focusing on the joy set before him. He entrusted himself to God and he focused on what was to come. He focused on the joy that was going to happen for him. Man, we got to have a forward look. See, that, that's one thing I like to point out when I'm working with people. 
And I have watched The Passion of the Christ. I said, I want you to pay attention to something here. Uh, and I, it's been a while since I've watched it, but I believe it's in the scene where Jesus is, is carrying his cross. In his mind, he flashes back to making furniture with his mom. That is completely opposite to what the scripture says. He was focused on the joy that was set before him. And that's where his focus, that's where his picture was. See, there's something also that's really cool here. That it talks about Jesus being the author and perfecter of faith. That means literally he wrote the book on it as the author. Uh, the word of God, right? Mr. Hoffman was talking about last night. And that's how Jesus did it. Fixing his eyes on the joy that was set before him. Go to Luke chapter 9. Luke 9, verse 51. It says, And it came about when the days were approaching for his ascension that he resolutely set his face to go to Jerusalem. Notice what he was looking forward to? The joy that was set before him. You know, it doesn't say that when the days were approaching for his crucifixion, says when the days were approaching for his ascension man there is a mindset and a picture that we see in our lord for the joy set before him what was to come that's where his mindset his focus and his picture was go back to first peter chapter two we'll talk a little bit about the why here Understand when I I separate these out between the how and the why, it's a pretty blurry line between the two of those things, just so you know. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you were healed. See, he was looking forward to, to that and he knew that the only way that man could have fellowship with God was through him but it's interesting notice what he says here that we might die to sin and live to righteousness do you know that God never had any intention Jesus never had any intention for you to be a forgiven sinner never had any intention of that that, that wasn't his plan. Hey, I'm going to go to the cross. I'm going to do the, all these things. I'm going to be a perfect example. I'm going to be the author and perfecter of faith so that you can be exactly the same as you were before, just forgiven. Guys, I, I, I've said it before. Say it again. The old covenant had provision for sin. If there was no fault with the first, there wouldn't have been an occasion for the second, the writer in Hebrews says. Man, that was his plan. A perfect conscience before God to live righteously, to die to sin. That's part of the why. A man by the name of Victor Frankl wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning. And we're going to talk a little bit more about him later, but he was a, in the, the internment camps in World War II as a, as a Jew. And he was a, a I believe he was a psychologist. And, and afterwards, he, he did a lot of lectures and things like that. And in one of his lectures, he, he had everybody think about what the, the meaning of life was and to write it down on a piece of paper. And one guy got the same answer he did. And it goes like this. The meaning of your life is to help others find the meaning in theirs. Uh, that's the why for Jesus going to the cross. I want you to think about this for a second. And, you know, I've heard people talking about, you know, that, man, Jesus, the, the joy that was set before him was the throne. D- didn't Jesus have the throne before he came to earth? I mean, it was probably nice to go back there. Mark talked about us last night, sleeping in tents, and that's to remind us of our, of our homes. 
I got a new travel trailer to me this year, Mark, and it has a shower in it. it it, it's not the same as my shower at home, though. I will tell you that. You use water sparingly, shut it off, soap off. You know, it's a hot, cold kind of thing. You know, I mean, you know, I'm sure it was nice for Jesus to return to the throne, but that's not why he came to earth. Because he already had the throne. Man, he did it for us. Go with me to Revelation chapter 21. Verse 2. Revelation 21, verse 2 says, And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he shall dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be among them. Skip down to verse 9. And one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of seven last plagues came and spoke to me saying, Come here, I shall show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her brilliance was like a very costly stone, a stone of crystal clear jasper. And he goes on to describe more about the beauty of this bride. That's the joy that was set before him, was the bride. Uh, it's pretty cool. As, as, as the king, you know what he looked forward to? His wedding day. He looked forward to a bride that would share eternity with him, would share the kingdom with him. The joy that was set before him. My, my wife and I just recently celebrated our, our 20th year anniversary. Uh, man, and I give her about 98% of the credit on that. Um, it might be 99. Uh, but as I was preparing for this, it just reminded me of something. I had a, a, a friend that attended our wedding, and, and he had a little boy that was about two years old at the time. And this little boy was completely enamored with my wife and her wedding dress. Like, just... I mean, just staring at her, and, and uh, I was like, hey, buddy. <laughs> Back off a little bit here. We've been married for a few minutes now, you know. I mean, But, man, that, that's you. That's how the Lord sees you. Man, this beautiful bride, he's enamored by us, by his church. And it's important to recognize here, and i got to tell you, there's a mental shift that has to go in my mind to think of myself being a bride. It's, it's not my first thought. But I can understand and appreciate value. Man, he said, this bride is so worth it. I'm willing to suffer incredibly for her. That's the why. That's the why Jesus came to earth. That's the why Jesus endured the cross, despising the shame. So that he could be seated on the throne forever with his bride, the church. Man, what an awesome thing to remember. I, I just got to share this with you too. Um, you know, when you, when you get to preach them, you have to take opportunities to embarrass your children at times. And uh, this, this may be one of those coming right up. Uh, we, uh, we took that wedding dress and, and we got conned into paying somebody a bunch of money to box it up and hermetically seal it and all this kind of jazz. And so I've been telling my wife forever, I said, that, that box just has newspaper in it. They kept that dress, sold it. And, and we've been packing this thing around for years. And I'm telling you that a wedding dress in a box it doesn't really fit anywhere. Like, it's just an awkward size. It, it's too big for the top of the closet. It doesn't work under the bed. So we've been packing around. And, and my wife opened the box. And, and her wedding dress was in there. Uh, so I was wrong. Maybe 99.5% on her making this thing work. And uh, we might be all the way to the 100 if I keep talking. I should probably stop going there. Uh, put that wedding dress on right now I, I was not 
she, she looked she looked absolutely beautiful and I was like nope <laughs> not ready for that that had nothing to do with the story other than the challenges we face in life when you think that, that, that somebody else may someday take your daughter away from me I, I, I don't know you guys that have done this already and married off your daughters are, are any of them good enough for them I'm not sure yet, so maybe I just haven't come across the right one. So, all right, go back to First Peter chapter two. We're going to run through the context here. Uh, Becca, I hope I didn't embarrass you too bad. I said you look beautiful in it, so that was good, right? Yeah. Okay. It's also important to call them out every now and again to make sure that connections there. So, First Peter chapter two. And I didn't tell you this part, but this is the prelude to the context. Verse 5. You also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Verse 9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God, and you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Again, clear communication from God. You are my chosen ones. You are my plan. You are the one that I have been looking for since before the dawn of time. My precious chosen ones. See, sometimes when we read our Bible, unfortunately we, we get chapter or we get uh, caught in chapters and verses rather than reading the Bible because there's a whole lot of context that goes with this and so there's a reason that, that Peter inspired by the Holy Spirit recording for us a message for all time reminds us of who we are before he starts telling us how to do some things this is the reminder you are my holy race. Chosen, royal priesthood, holy nation, people for my own possession. It's time to get up. All right. Okay. Hope that doesn't mean I'm out of time because we're, we're just getting started. <clears throat> Here's the context. We're going to work our way through 1 Peter chapter 2 here. Um, continuing on and into 1 Peter chapter 3 because it's all part of the context. Okay? <clears throat> Verses 13 and 14 of chapter 2. Submit yourself for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as to the one in authority or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. You want to know how to make this really easy? I'm going to make this very easy to do for you. Just remember which kingdom you're a citizen of. If you do that, the rest of this gets easy. If you lose sight of what kingdom you actually belong to, this is difficult. Who's your king? Is it the, the seated president? Or is it the Lord Jesus? Who's your king? I had a conversation a long time ago with Luke Wilson. We were, we were driving to Great Falls. and you know, this, The subject of taxes came up. I don't even remember. I think Luke sometimes tried to set me up a few times. This may have been one of them. He said, so, so how much taxes would you pay? And, and, and my answer was, as much as I could until I could anymore, and then I wouldn't worry about it. Huh? I think his was, was along the same lines, if I recall, right? You know, do, do I think that the current tax system in the United States of America is fair and just? Did my expression not communicate my answer? No, I don't think it's fair and just. I can tell you that I know what I've paid in taxes and I, I can do the math and I know it doesn't cost the United States of America nearly that much for me to live here. I know it doesn't. That's not fair and just. So what? 
See, he starts off something here. I'm going to come back to this. Notice how this context starts off. For the Lord's sake. See, if I'm worried about how much taxes I'm paying or what the government's doing to me, whose sake am I worried about? Oh, then it's for my sake. Now, again, I'm not telling you that I, I vote for tax increases. I don't do that. But it's not on my plate. And, and, and I'm telling you, I've seen the changes in this country. And brothers and sisters, wait till it starts ramping up. It hasn't even started yet. The slide into depravity is getting steeper. And the social decay and the moral decay of our society is getting worse and worse. And, and not, not by addition, by factors. It is bad. Who's your king? Verse 18. Servants, be submissive to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and gentle, but also to those who are unreasonable. Servants and masters. Well, it's a good thing we live in this free land of the United States of America, and we don't have those things, right? Let, let, me, let me help uh, make it relevant to us here in the United States. Bosses and employees. How about kids to parents? Uh, what, what's it say here? It says, be submissive only if they are super good and treat you with kid gloves and are kind to you at all times and never, ever, ever hurt your feelings or do or say anything wrong. Well, it says if they're unreasonable. Yeah, right, yeah. Yeah, that, that'll fix it, yeah. Uh, even if they're unreasonable. You know what that means? It means it doesn't matter how they are to what your response should be. That's what it says. Okay, get ready. We're getting ready to step into it. First Peter chapter 3, verse 1. It's the context, folks. It's all connected. In the same way, you wives, be submissive to your own husbands, so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives. And it goes on. Hey, wives, does it depend on what kind of husband you have regarding how you're supposed to behave towards him? It's context, isn't it? <laughs> We're going to come back to this, but remember this that you do it for the Lord's sake. <clears throat> verse 8, or I'm sorry, verse 7. You husbands, likewise. You ever notice that words have meaning? You know, you know what likewise says? Uh, pay attention to what we've been talking about. That's what it says. That's what likewise means. You husbands, likewise. Live with your wives in an understanding ways with a weaker vessel since she is a woman and grant her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life so that your prayers may not be hindered. Wow, guys, we got off easy. Them, them ladies got six verses. We only got one. Woo. You know what? Hey, husbands, for the Lord's sake. How you, how you treat your wife and interact with your wife doesn't depend on her, it depends on you. That's a scriptural message here. This is the context related to us. See, Mike Tyson has a great quote. And I know this is going to sound anybody like, Mike Tyson, great quote. Okay. Stay with me. It goes like this. Everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 4. <clears throat> 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. 
Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing so that also at the revelation of his glory you may be rejoice with exultation. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of God and of the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. Verse 18. And if it is with difficulty that the righteous is saved, what will become of the godless man and the sinner? Therefore, let those also who suffer according to the will of God entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. Don't be surprised that the fiery ordeal has come am- uh, is among you. It's not as if some strange thing is happening to you. Hey, guess what? This life is supposed to be hard. Uh, You look at the ministry of Jesus, the three and a half years that we have recorded about His life. You tell me where it was easy. It's supposed to be hard. Do you think if it was necessary for Jesus our Lord to go through hard things, that it's necessary for us as well? Maybe that's God's formula for making citizens of heaven. Don't be surprised. Hey, this life is not going to be easy. You're going to get punched in the mouth. I, I don't know about you guys, but there's, there's particular things that stick in my mind. And, and one of them is was a message that was preached at family camp a long time ago about Tweety Bird and a vacuum cleaner. Oh, I can't even tell you how many years ago that was, Mike. It was a long time ago. Man, I, I, I've used that example a lot. Yeah, he's minding his own business, and man, he gets sucked up in the vacuum. Mike can do it way better than me. I'm not going to uh, take that from him. But man, guess what? Man, you're just chirping along. He gets sucked into the vacuum cleaner. Man, it happens. Now, now sometimes, sometimes it can be from a... A, a weather machine of your own making. The storms of life. And we're ta- what we're talking about here in the context today is when the things of this life happen. The storms of life hit. Man, you guys remember vacation Bible school, right? The wise man, the foolish man, they're building their house in the rock and the sand. And what's common to all men? The storms of life. Don't be surprised when stuff happens to you. It's supposed to That's the way it goes. Man, I'm telling you, be careful. Don't buy into the mantra of the religious world out there that if you do good, only good things will happen to you. That is a bunch of garbage. Jesus was perfect. How'd that work out for him in the flesh? Man, that's a rough deal. See, we think about the physical side of it. You think about the betrayal that Jesus underwent. You know what's interesting? When the scripture talks about it, it talks about the night of his betrayal. It's easy to think about that just being Judas only. Everybody left him. Those guys that he spent time with and communicated with and loved and cared for, they all left him. Don't be surprised. The fiery ordeal. Now... I'm not talking about when your Fitbit cheats you out of some steps during the day. But you're pretty sure you, you burned more calories than it said you did. That's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about some tough stuff. It's going to happen. That's the way it is. Did you ever think about Job? consider Job. I mean, God asked Satan to consider Job. We can consider him too, right? Huh? You ever think about that guy? What, what did he do? He's minding his own business. He's a good guy. Righteous. Upright before the Lord. Man, uh, when his kids are having birthday parties, he stands, stays home praying that they don't do anything wrong. He's a good guy. What did he do? What did he do to deserve what came upon him? Nothing. In fact, the whole rest of the book of Job, his friends try to convince him that he must have done something, and he didn't. The 
the way it goes. Guys, we got to be tough. Look at Jesus. You got to be tough. You got to be tough in the stuff now so you can handle the bigger stuff that comes at you. You got to be tough. Verse 19 there again in 1 Peter 4. Therefore, let those also who suffer according to the will of God entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. Where is your trust? Well, it's pretty interesting that we get reminders all around us of where we should trust. You, you pull out the the current fiat currency of the United States of America, and it says, in God we trust. There's a reminder right there. Where's your trust? Is it in trust in that paper? Or in trust in the Lord? Where's your trust? Man, we got to entrust our souls to that faithful creator. Go back to 1 Peter chapter 2. Let's talk about the how. Verse 21, for you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth, and while being reviled, he did not revile in return, while suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. That's the how. Where's your trust? We had a, a, a meeting years ago in, in, in Billings and, and uh, it was after one of the school shootings and things like that. And, you know, was a, there was a question that was asked and this is the verse that came to my mind. You want to know the best defense against anything this world has to offer? Entrust yourself to him who judges righteously. Is your trust in the Lord God or Smith and Wesson. Where's your trust? <clears throat> the last time I checked, the ammunition you put in that Smith and Wesson is in limited supply. Where's the limit of God? Where's your trust? You cannot be an overwhelming conqueror unless you entrust yourselves to him who judges righteously. You can't do it. See, some interesting things to talk about here. Viktor Frankl, one of the internment camps he was in was in Auschwitz. And the first thing they did when they, they took you out of the, the cattle cars, before they washed you off, they shaved you and stripped you naked. And then when you came out the other side, you didn't get the clothes that you had on. You got the leftover rags from the dead. They were in those internment camps. And you got your number tattooed on your skin, and that's what you became. You lost your identity. Everything was stripped away from him. He said he remembered being in that camp. And there were some conversations with some of the others that they had come in with that were, that were still present. And they asked some of the other prisoners if they knew what happened to their friends. And the prisoners pointed to the smoke coming out of the chimney. Said, there they are. There's tough stuff that happens in this life. <clears throat> Victor Frankl, in that book he wrote, The Man's Search for Meaning, says that the last of the human freedoms is the power to choose one's own attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. That's the last freedom. See, they discovered in that, in that prison camp, and obviously as a, 
as a psychologist, he was interested in the human psyche and how it worked. And in that prison camp, they, he could figure out by watching people when they had given up and when they were going to die. And instead of going out to work for the day, they stayed in their bed and smoked a cigarette. It's a true story. That's how they knew within the next 48 hours that guy was going to be dead. But they also discovered some stuff by, by examining the human psyche and take a look at there that people inside those internment camps, you know what they were still able to do if they chose to? Have a great attitude. And help each other out. See, the guards couldn't strip that from them. The SS couldn't take away the power to choose the last human freedom. When everything was stripped away, they were able to make that choice. This quote from the book, it says, the sort of person that the individual became was the result of an inner decision and not the results of camp influences alone. Any man, even under such circumstances, decide what shall become of him mentally and spiritually. The last inner freedom cannot be lost, can't be taken away. See, there was a discovery that he made there. It says, it doesn't matter how bad your circumstances are, you choose. Now, do you think that with us having the Spirit of Christ dwelling inside of us, the power that spoke this world into existence, the power that more importantly raised you from the dead, do you think with that power inside of you that that gives us the power to choose what kind of attitude we're going to have? Isn't that the context we just talked about with our governments and, and slaves and masters and parents and kids and husbands and wives? Don't we get to decide? I can tell you this, if those without Christ could decide in an internment camp in Auschwitz, what's our excuse? Because I'm going to tell you, I, I look back on the tough days of my life and I never saw my friends going up and smoking a chimney. I've never had everything taken away from me. Not once. And I, as I look around the room, I'm going to bet that I can make the same statement for every one of you. On your darkest day, you didn't have remotely that challenge. Guys, we got to get tough. Mentally, we got to be tough. <clears throat> 2 Timothy chapter 2. Verse 7. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but one of power and love and discipline. See, between the, the stimulus of this life and the response, there's a space. And that space is the power to choose. What are you going to do? The power to choose. God didn't give you a, a, a spirit of timidity. He didn't give you a spirit that you just get run over. You get driven by the winds. Let me rephrase that. He didn't give you a spirit that says, so-and-so made me do that. So-and-so made me mad. That's not the spirit we were given. One of power and love and discipline. That's the spirit we've been given. And we got to get tough. All right, now on to the why for us. First Peter chapter 2. I brought it up early. earlier, we'll hit it again. Verse 13. Submit yourself for the Lord's sake. 
right there, folks. In your life, those relationships, the, the influences that are on you, you do it right for the Lord's sake. Not for your own sake. That's when it gets messed up. When it becomes about us instead of about being for the Lord's sake, that's where it gets messed up. You want an early example of that? Cain and Abel. There's an early example of it. One of them was for the Lord's sake, one of them was for my sake. And what happened? Abel's blood cried out from the ground to God. That's what happened. Cain threw a pity party because God didn't like his sacrifice. And instead of figuring it out, what did he do? Oh, I know the problem. That Abel guy, he's got to go. That's what happens when it's for your sake instead of for the Lord's sake. It gets all messed up. That's a reminder. When the government's coming after you, guess what? Handle it right. Why? For the Lord's sake. I'm just going to tell you, brothers and sisters, man, I've, I've heard this my whole life. When they come for my guns, they can have them bullets first. I'm going to tell you, man, when they come for your guns, give them to them. For the Lord's sake. Don't you think it's a better example that you can let them know which kingdom you're actually fighting for? And don't get me wrong, I'm not telling you that I want the United States of America to fall. I'm just telling you, look at the record of the history of nations. And I believe that you can be a lot more effective, alive for Christ, than shooting the guy that came to take your guns. I know that's not popular. We're in Montana. This is the, the land of the free, right? Home of the brave. Armed citizens everywhere. Just telling you, man. Remember what your fight is. For the Lord's sake, submit yourself to every human institution. For the Lord's sake, what's your kingdom? What are we fighting for? We get to choose the righteous response between the stimulus and our response in that space. The power to choose. We have the freedom to choose. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 11. Verse 24. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, considering the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. Sometimes if you don't read your scripture right, if you don't see what's really going on, and I appreciate what Mark said, right? Read the Old Testament with one eye in the New Testament. If you don't understand that stuff, it looks like Moses is like a ping pong ball that just gets bounced around and ends up delivering the people out of Egypt. That's what it looks like if you don't read it right. But if you read it right, what's he say? He says, the riches of Christ are greater than the riches of Egypt. Man, he made that choice. He chose Christ. Do you know what the adopted son of Pharaoh's daughter, do you know what responsibilities he probably would have had in Egypt? Probably not much. Do you know what would have been at his disposal? Pretty much everything of Egypt. Like, there wouldn't have, like he's not going to be Pharaoh. He's not going to be leading the country, but he's going to get all the benefit of all the spoils. Literally, the riches of Egypt were at his disposal with, honestly, very little responsibility. What did he choose? The reproach of Christ. Man, these things are written as an example for our instruction. So we'll learn from them upon us, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. So we listen to the lessons of Moses. Do you think it was easy for Moses to give up the palace to deal with a whiny group of people for 40 years, 50 years. Man, I'm, I got to tell you, I appreciate Moses' faithfulness because when God says, let's wipe him out, and Moses pleads our case, like, I'm impressed with Moses. 
I am. Because there's certain times in my life, if I was most on point, I'd be like, deal. Tomorrow, <laughs> works good for me. You want to make a new nation out of me? I'm in. Let's do it, man. These people, what in the world? Right? What are they looking for? They're crying about going back to Egypt. Who really had something to look back to if they wanted to? Moses did, right? Man, he was the... the kind of like the rich playboy kid that didn't have any responsibilities. That's what he could have been. For the Lord's sake, we need to choose the reward in Christ that comes from the reproaches over human institutions, servants to masters, kids to parents, wives to husbands, husbands to wives, all those relationships, we need to do them right for the Lord's sake. And it doesn't depend on what the other person does to us. If it did, it wouldn't talk about Jesus in the middle of that context being an example for us to follow. That's the center of that context. There's this nugget right in the middle of it that says, this is how this is accomplished. But you do it the way that Jesus did it. Did those guys treat Jesus good the night that he was on trial? Okay, I'll help you. It's okay to answer. No, they didn't treat him good. It was terrible, right? That was brutal. It was interesting when we left the movie theater that night after watching The Passion of Christ, nobody said a word. The whole theater. It was completely quiet when people walked out of the movie. It's interesting. Because you know what they realized? This guy suffered something so incredible. And he did it without defending himself. Now they, they talk about the prison, that it's full of innocent men, right? I know this for a fact. There is one guy in the history of the world, one guy absolutely for certain that was on trial, that was to put to death unrighteously, that had done nothing wrong, didn't deserve it. And you know what's really interesting? That same guy, you know who his defense attorney was? No one. You know what he offered as a defense? Nothing. In fact, sometimes you take a look at it, the little bit that there is some response, he kind of digs his own grave a little bit, doesn't he? Like, you know, you're the king? Yep. Oh, not in this world, all my servants be fighting, you know? <clears throat> what do he do? For the joy set before him. For the Lord's sake. <clears throat> 1 Peter chapter 2. Take a look at another why here for us. First Peter chapter 2, verse 11. Beloved, I urge you, as aliens and strangers, to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles. So that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may on account of your good deeds as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. You know why else you do these things? For others' sake. Be the example. How does he start out? Behold, I urge you as citizens of the United States of America. That's not what he says, is it? I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts. Aliens and strangers. We've got to remember who we are in this thing. God, please, please don't misunderstand. I don't hate the United States of America. This is not my kingdom. No. We, we live in, in Williston, North Dakota. We're very close to Canada. Sometimes I like to, to, to go to the, the stock car race. It's the weirdest thing. They sing the American National Anthem, and then they sing the Canadian Anthem. And you know what? It feels weird to me when sitting there, and they're playing the Canadian thing, and there's, you know, we're still standing up, and I'm like, I don't know what to do with myself. Do I stand up? Do I sit down? I mean, I don't know what to do. Aliens and strangers. We shouldn't know what to do with ourselves with some of these things. What we should be doing is for the Lord's sake and for others' sake. We should stand out as a separate kingdom. 
back in February, my family and I went up to, to Winnipeg. And uh, just because we're that close, we went to Canada. And, and uh, I can tell you what, it's different than the United States of America. It is. They have this weird plastic money. Like, it's plastic. Their bills are plastic. You know, and, I mean, they're flexible and everything. And they're see-through parts of them. And then you got unis and toonies or whatever it is, ones and two dollars. And, and, and the weirdest thing, man, we're paying for dinner and I give them my card and they bring the thing to the table. They don't, they don't, they won't take your card. So we're having a discussion with the guy and the guy literally is like, so in America, they actually take your card? We thought that was just in the movies. I said, let me see that. And I take the thing and I show him, see, so it says insert card here. This is with your card here for you to take it. Uh, it was a weird thing, man. I felt weird. And he felt weird too, by the way, because I probably made him feel weird. But I was like, man, we should feel like angel, aliens and strangers. This isn't our land. What we need to do is for others' sake, for the Lord's sake, we need to stand out. Not by folding, but by being tough. First Peter 3.15. We're almost done. It says, But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. For others' sake. Man, when you do things different, people want to know. Always be ready to make a defense. We'll sum up here. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. Literally starts out to sum up. Let all be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead, for you are called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. And he goes on to talk about those things. To sum up. Not only if it's going good, far as it depends on you. Brothers and sisters, we need to get tough. We get serious about the gospel, serious about the kingdom of God. We stop playing around in the world. He gives us a, a warning there to act as free men and do, don't use our freedom as a covering for evil. Man, we got to stop messing around and we got to get serious about it. There's an example that's given in Jesus Christ and you tell me, was he messing around or was he serious? He was serious, man. You don't endure the cross if you're not serious. You realize he could have tapped out at any time. He didn't. He also could have not just tapped out and gone away, but he could have called legions of angels to come teach them guys a lesson. But he didn't. Because he had fixed his eyes on where he was going. He had fixed his eyes on the joy set before him. And as a reminder, that's us, the church. That is the example for us to follow in his steps. Right now. As a, the writer of Hebrews says in chapter 3, while it is still called today, right now, get tough. Thank you.